What is happiness? It is so elusive, undefinable, or is it? Researchers are gaining a much greater understanding of what makes people happy. Our next guest is taking the ideas of some of our most trenchant thinkers and applying them to cities. Can the design of our cities make us happier? Our next guest has traveled the world trying to answer this question. He has just published a book that is getting international recognition. The New York Times has recommended it as a must reading for their new mayor. Please welcome Charles Montgomery. So, yes, I have spent the last uh, several years looking at the intersection between um, city design and the science of happiness. Can we build happier cities? And as anybody who knows um, John Helliwell, the economist emeritus at UBC, who advises the UN on happiness, it's all wrapped up in that song, right? The more we get together, the happier we'll be. It. That's what John sings. I'm not going to ask you to sing tonight. But there is truth in those words. So what we need to hold close is the most powerful ingredient of human happiness, and this applies to cities too, is strong, positive social connections. Now, I believe we can achieve that through design, through the way we create our cities, the way we live in them, and their systems. I list all these ways in my terrific book, and I don't have time to go through them tonight, so I'm just going to tell you one quick story. In the course of my research, I was becoming more and more frustrated that I couldn't find that one expert who combined those ideas, who had all the empirical evidence to back up the, the design side of creating cities. And then I got this invitation from the Guggenheim Museum to help create an urban laboratory uh, in the Lower East Side of New York City. So we turned an empty lot into this laboratory for understanding. And I thought, well, isn't this great? You know, they're being funded by BMW, the big, evil, terrific car company. And um, I can use their resources. So I invited neuroscientists and artists and psychologists to come together. And we, we created a tour of the Lower East Side where we uh, gained an understanding of the uh, psychological effect of public space. We invited children to redesign neighborhoods. But my favorite and maybe strangest experiment was uh, when I realized we had a, bit, a bit, big chunk of money in the budget, and I could invite them all together to uh, reconfigure this empty lot into a machine for building um, social connections, breaking down differences between New Yorkers for one night. Now, this was New York, so that would be no easy task, get New Yorkers, New Yorkers talking and friendly to each other. So I, I invited a, a kind of a crack team of, um, of happy city superheroes to help me uh, pull this off. And we had some money, so some people got paid. Not me, really. Uh, so first, who, who was first? There, was, there were the psychologists. And uh, they had this theory that if you're holding a cup of something warm, it causes you to have warmer feelings for the people around you. It has a metaphorical effect. It actually works. It's reflected in the empirical uh, research. So they, set up a, they wanted to set up a hot chocolate stand. And the idea is that you, can, you can't have one. You only get two hot chocolates. And the second one you have to give to the person in the back of the lineup. I said, fine, you're in. Then I invited an artist named Ryan Brennan. And this guy uh, created all these devices that he called bubble bursting devices. One was a poster you put on a wall and has two handprints. Uh, you put your hand on, a stranger puts their hand on, and you're not allowed to take your hands off and, until you're no longer strangers. So a little bit of nudging there. I said, fine, you're in as well. Uh, who else did we have? Um, ah, yes, uh, people from Project for Public Spaces. These are public space activists. And they created a, a, a slideshow of people being flirtatious and affectionate in public. So the idea is, is that you prime people to be prepared to be nice to other people in public. Great, you're in too. We changed the lighting. And then being in New York, you go to all these parties. And at one party, I met a a teacher in a program of fashionable technology at Parsons. I'm like, you're in. Whatever you do, you're in. This sounds great. What they did, wanted to do, was create um, garments, heat-sensitive garments that would change colors when people came close to each other. So that seemed pretty cool. And then, uh, who was left? Uh, yeah, the, the last piece in this puzzle, and the, the kind of the mind-bending fellow, was this guy I met at Disneyland, where we went and harassed people on Main Street, USA. Um, he studied oxytocin. Now, oxytocin, as many of you know, is the hormone that women release when they give birth. It helps create that bond between mother and child. Well, as Paul Zak, my, my neuroeconomist friend, said, anytime we have a trust-building encounter, we get that release of oxytocin. 
So he said, I, I, I want to activate that hormone release. So we're going to do it through hugging. I said, hugging? You mean you and me? And he goes, no, no, everybody needs to hug for a good half hour. <laughs> so, you know, we had all the players in place. The big night came. And what amazed me at first is that New Yorkers showed up. It was a free event, so why not? Um, but they cooperated. So primed with all these, uh, all these devices, they drank the hot chocolate, they passed it around, they talked to strangers, and yes, they even started hugging. First they hugged their friends, then they hugged a couple of strangers. Me and Paul had to lead the thing, he's a, he's a big hugger. It's, you have to breathe deeply before he hugs you because he squeezes the air right out. But how, you know, after about half an hour, everybody was hugging. There was strangers hugging strangers and group hugs. It was a giant, crazy cuddle puddle hugness. And, <laughs> and you know, the, the Guggenheim curators in their, you know, black turtlenecks were like just completely appalled. It was, this is not high art. Um, but by the end of the night, we all kind of felt giddy and wonderful and, and the oxytocin was flowing. And, and none of this is why I'm telling you this story. <laughs> because without even really trying to, we were conducting an experiment in this, a kind of a, maybe a meta experiment, um, covering all of these minor experiments. During the course of this three month lab, we played a game, we created a game, it was an online game and on big screens on the site. It was called Urbanology. And it asked you questions about the kind of city you want, the kind of society you want, values based questions like, do you think people who work, uh, who are forced to work overnight, should be paid a higher minimum wage. And over the three month course of the lab, typically 90% of the people answered, hell no, this is New York, tough it out. <laughs> but on love night, after, did I not mention that's what it was called? <laughs> Maybe that's why people came. <laughs> so anyway, after a night of kind of design conviviality and priming, the answers were, we're, we're turned on their head. 80% of the people said, well, yes, of course you should pay people, people more overnight. People voted for a slower city, a greener city, a more sustainable city, a fairer city, a more empathetic city. This experience, this designed experience, it brought out the best in us. So to me, this was really remarkable. And I, I'm saying this to you tonight, not because I want you all to start hugging, but, well, let me explain why. I want to read something to you. The Vancouver Foundation did this study uh, back in 2012 looking at community connections. And everybody may remember that the problem is that we feel disconnected here in Vancouver. And they pointed out quite accurately, how can we begin to tackle complex issues like poverty, poverty and homelessness if people are disconnected, isolated, and indifferent? How can we make people care about community issues if their concern stops at their front yard? Well. I believe through my extensive research that in fact, beyond just reaching out, we can build sociability and empathy into the design of our places. And I'm very lucky to have landed here in Vancouver with the Museum of Vancouver where we are creating programs to empower people to use the city as a laboratory. So this spring you should look for student interventions, student machines working with the museum to get people talking, to get neighbors talking. But more broadly, my point is, yes, we can build these things into the city, but the city is still a mystery. These relationships, these forces are still a mystery, mystery and we should treat the city as our laboratory. We should con conduct experiments in architecture, in design, in transportation networks, and in the way we live. And I invite you to join me on that journey. So, if you really want a hug tonight, I am signing books outside. I'll get, the hugs are free. <laughs> but, Please join me on this journey. I'm not alone, and it's an exciting place to go, and we need to go there if we want to build an empathic society. Thank you. Thank you so much.